Welcome to episode 236 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, The Guardian, and Frances, today is one of those exciting days. Barca has won three straight matches for the first time under Ronald Koeman, and we are celebrating with an edition of La Ronda, our listener questions. That's fantastic. That is that is awesome. Um, it feels like a lifetime ago that Barca actually won more than one match, one after the other, three in a row. It seems to be, you know, we've been treated. But um, this this used to be the norm, so we should enjoy it while it lasts and hopefully it can continue. Well, our listener questions, as expected, certainly did challenge us anyway. So we're going to do our best to be positive, but there's some interesting questions coming up as well. And I think without further ado, and I before I even begin, I, I want to give a quick as I always do. There might be some repeats I missed and we got so, so many questions. We're not going to get to all of them, of course. So I'm sorry in advance when we don't get to one that you might have asked or something similar and I missed it. So without further ado, let's get our listener questions started with one from Minor. Never run. Tobias and Tom also asked something similar. What changes did Coleman make to rattle off the three straight victories? Frances, I guess I'll give you the the broad stroke and I have some individual stuff that I hit, but let me let me let you go first. Okay, um, I think that the main difference is that Messi is finally finding the net. You know, I think that Messi is beginning to be Messi again. I think that, you know, he, Kuman obviously has had a system that has been sort of consistent throughout. Um, he started building the house from the bases. You know, he's been strengthening defense, obviously, with his 4 2 and then 3 1 normally at the start uh, of the season, strengthening the back. And then as the year progresses, there seems to be less people at the back or less people sort of staying at the back just to protect. And actually there's that they're creating. I think the key difference over the last month, really, or not even month, just the last four or five matches is the fact that Frankie is Frankie the young, obviously is breaking more into the attacking, um, making a superiority up front that we didn't have before. But ultimately the biggest difference is that Messi is happy with, with his surroundings. His teammates are beginning to click. And uh, I think Pedri, to be honest, is the one that you have to pinpoint one player that is making Messi back to, or helping him get him back to where he is, which is the best player in the world, is, is Pedri. I think that, in a way, Messi sees himself in Pedri's energy, youth, freshness. And, um, you know, since Xavi and Iniesta left, he hasn't really had uh, that partner that he always needs because let's face it, Messi is a great player, but he cannot win games by himself unless the other 10 are sort of rowing in the same direction. And I think Pedri, Pedri speaks the same language as Messi. They understand each other really well. Pedri is really unselfish as well. And Messi is feeding off that. Um, you've got other, other players that are slowly but surely getting back to their form which is Dembele obviously coming back, Griezmann coming back, as I said, Frankie uh, breaking the lines and, and becoming more of a total player that we all know that he could be. And he was sort of, he's becoming more similar to himself at Ajax, uh, put it that way. So I think it's the fact that the players trust in Kuman enough to grow themselves. I think in terms of Kuman making many changes, um, you could argue the formation has changed slightly from a 4 2 3 one to an very arguably, to a 4-3-3 at times. But um, I think the main difference is that the players are happy and that they're performing closer to what the level is. Yeah, Frances, you, you walked right into my trap because that's what you did. You gave me the broad strokes and the big ideas, and then I basically have a little bit to back up each of those arguments. Let's start Good. with the question. <laughs> that's why I need you, Dan. <laughs> well, we're going to start with a question from en Enrique that you already kind of hit. He asked, is Messi's heart back in it? And not to be heartless, not to be the cold calculated one of the group, but his XG or expected goals was fine. It told you that he should have been the Pachichi leader just with his expected goals. The ball wasn't going in the net and the shots that he was getting off all season just hadn't been going in. They also weren't in the best spots either. So uh, the expected G was probably even a little lower than it's been since he scored these goals in the last uh, three or four matches. But now that he's combining, as you mentioned, better with Pedri up the middle, those shots are starting to go in because they're coming from better spots on the field. And yeah, he does look happier and calmer after the latest interview. And you, as we talked about the last two weeks, the weight of Bartomeu 
certainly seems to be lifted off him with him out of the club. And his future is not really being talked about as much because a new president hasn't arrived. And the onus of Messi's future, the responsibility of Messi's future is now going to be on the new president to convince Messi to stay, as opposed to, I think we've all kind of accepted that whether he leaves or stays, it's, it's okay. It's everyone's got to that point where he, by even returning for this season, when he was trying to force his way out, it seems that everyone knows. And it was silly that there were any doubts, but his heart was never not in it. If that, I, I know it's a double negative, but I, I, you can never say that Messi was never willing to play for the crest of FC Barcelona. I, I think it's, it, it's silly to assume. So that said uh, numerically, he was always in it. And now the numbers are being backed up by the ball going in the back of the net. And I think that's the only difference because for having a down year, he's already leading Spain once again in goals, beating out the likes of Diago Aspas and Jared Moreno, the former Espanol, now Villarreal striker. So Luis Suarez as well. But anyway, as you mentioned about the 4-3-3 formation, uh, I, I do think looking at the heat maps that you can call it and should call it a 4-3-3. Uh, yeah, it's a little fluid because of Messi and because of Pedri's positioning that things kind of, uh, you know, they do look wacky a bit because of those two. But if you make them all freeze in spot, almost like when you're in, in uh primary school they say you know you play freeze tag if you'd have everyone freeze at one moment it'd be a 4-3-3 and as you mentioned de young doing well as the as an interior not a double pivot at all not a defensive midfielder he is an interior at the moment position wise pedri is great everywhere and uh steven did make a mention of our listener xavi and yes he wanted to make a comparison there but the 10 years since messi and yes xavi with the ballon d'or finalness we're also celebrating that this week but yet let's not get ahead of ourselves as i said even now a month ago when you become a legend at FC Barcelona, you get to have your own name. So we're not looking for Xavi or Iniesta. We're looking for the first Pedri that we'll talk about forever. We're looking for the first De Young that we'll talk about forever. So yeah, you hope that they get to that level, but we just want to have to wind up comparing other players to De Young and Pedri and not compare them against other legends. And the guy I talked about, and it's crazy to say, but my man of the match uh, in the most recent win against Granada was Sergio Busquets because that was the best performance we've seen from him this season. And I don't think it is uh, any coincidence that moving back to a traditional 4-3-3 with him as a defensive midfielder, dropping in between those center backs. I also think it should be mentioned that two ball playing center backs in Umtiti and Mingueza alongside Busquets was very, very helpful in buildup. And it allowed Barcelona to take control of that match as we as we've been thinking about Busquets the best thing he does is changes the pace and and dictates play and that's what he did really well against Granada and and that's why uh, especially with he, when he is switching the field in the way that he was when he's helping with build up in the way that he did and defensively even when you're playing against a team like Granada and this is the big question too the level of competition is something we have to mention it's Huesca it's athletic club with a new manager and uh, Granada who've been beaten up by COVID this year you didn't see it because they did have close to a starting 11, but Granada's players have been in and out of the lineup this year because of COVID, and you don't know the lingering effects of what some of that starting 11 are dealing with. So I couple that all together, not to say the level of competition should take anything away from those three victories. However, Busquets playing well against those three is a really good sign. And uh, as I said on the match review as well, on the, up on YouTube from Granada, with Busquets in that 4-3-3 with De Young with Pedri and that formation that will win you nine of 10 games. Yes. You're going to have the Bayern Munich. You're going to have uh, athletic Madrid, Atletico Madrid this year, or Real Madrid playing well, whatever it may be. Nine of 10 games are going to be won with that formation because Barca have superior talent. Yes. Um, I totally agree. I think that we, and I don't want to repeat what you said. I agree basically um, in the larger sort of sense of the word. I think that, the key here is to keep a level head. Um, I think that I've read some comments in, in some of our groups um, that we're always quite in the middle. You know, I think that a lot of people these days, they like to go into channels or podcasts or articles or social media in which the, the guy just shouts all the time or they write in capitals or they just want to sack the manager after a week and, and all sorts of nonsense like that. Um, if that's what gets you likes on Instagram and Twitter or whatever, I don't want to be part of that. Um, I think that we need to keep a level head. Um, I think that it is really important that we know that Kuman is not a genius this week and Kuman didn't need to be sacked last week. You know, um, put it into perspective. We've got three matches that we've won. With all due respect, uh, Granada, Huesca, they're not really going to be fighting for titles, are they? And I think Atleti Bilbao, 
you know, it's it's a mid table, mid to top table, um, you know, like between the fifth and the tenth in La Liga um, at that. So we need to keep our feet on the ground. Um, obviously, it is positive that Barca are winning, but let's face it, in the last 20, 25 years, Barca would have always won at least seven points out of these three matches, you know, so so we, we need to put that into perspective. So that being said, I don't want to put a downer on it, but I think that we need to keep our feet on the ground. Um, there are important matches to come. Hopefully, if we continue to play this way and not just the play of it, of it because the play will, I think, will get better. I think it's the confidence and the self-belief and the trust that the players have on themselves and in what the manager is doing. I think that the only way is up, really. Um, we could get worse, obviously, but I don't really see that happening. Uh, but I think that we need to keep into perspective and, and be realistic with it. Yeah, and on that point about about Coleman, it's interesting that you hear the debate. Does the credit belong on the players or does the credit belong to Coleman? And obviously the answer is both, because as you've been saying that he's been able in this transition season, it seems like maybe he, he was stubborn for a while. And that's why you and I host the podcast every week because we have arguments as he was figuring it out, whether he would ever figure it out or not. Now that it looks like against the level of competition that they've played against, that he has figured it out. And even that win a few weeks ago against Real Sociedad. Now I know they're playing them uh, in, we're going to get this after the break, but the Supercopa, then that could change with Real Sociedad. But he has had some good victories as well, solid victories as well. And the reason why you give it to both Coleman and the individual player is because against Granada, I, not a single player had a poor match. And it seems like players are finally understanding their role. Dembele is playing the best defense he's ever played of his career. He's adding width and he's working well with Dest, who, as I've said, Dest has not had a, had a single bad game, but he's had some games that are less than stellar, sure, but he has not been ever bad. And even back his time at Ajax, he's a better defensive player under Coleman than he was against Eric Ten Hag, uh, which is, again, surprising to me, but they seem to be working well together. And Dembele has also done the same defensive job on the left as well, and his two-footedness and just being healthy for once in his career has been a, a big difference. And you saw the difference between Barca when Fati and Dembele were out of the lineup and when just one of them is in. So imagine when both of them are back in the lineup, Dembele and Fati and Griezmann as well. He's still in that starting 11 that we saw uh, most recently against Granada. He's still the only fish out of water, if you will. He's the only player who still doesn't really fit in the position that he's playing, but it, he did really well, whether this is Coleman's mm -hmm. instructions or Griezmann himself. He did really well against Granada, understanding the space that Messi and Pedri were working with in the middle and making complementary and auxiliary runs off of them. And as I always talk about with Barcelona, positional play, obviously those, those routes from, from Cruyff to Guardiola, that is Barcelona. When we talk about the Barcelona way, positional play, uh, uh, I mean, they're getting back to pressing in the way that they are. And then obviously being um, superior technical to your opponent. Those are all things that, that are in Barcelona's um, playing style and in, in the tactics, what you should expect from an FC Barcelona team when you tell a, a neutral who's never seen, uh, yeah, the one person on earth who's never seen FC Barcelona, who's not <laughs> football, you tell them that's what Barcelona football, what you should expect. And so Griezmann, as Messi and Pedri are getting a, a better relationship, as Griezmann then becomes basically that third member of that team to understand where he needs to be with that space uh, is very, very helpful. And as I said, when you have ball playing center backs and uh, as we go back to it, individuals that Langley has not been playing well. And he was, it was a yellow card suspension. It wasn't that he was dropped against Granada. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing that Umtiti, if he's healthy and Mingueta and Araujo, who seems to be injury prone now with his hamstrings, but it's good. It's a good thing. If there's competition at the center back spot, it's a good thing that if Langley is out of form, then Umtiti might be able to be trusted for a few games and who knows what level he can get back to. And the final point here, let me end with where we've gone all the way back in that defense with Ter Stegen. He's also getting back into top form. And all of that, Dembele defending and getting into form. Griezmann figuring out where he needs to be. Pedri and Messi in their connection. Ter Stegen getting back to form. It's all happening together. So credit is obviously given to those individuals for figuring things out and all kind of working well together. And the credit's also deserved to Komen as well for putting it all together and building on that foundation. And, you know, as stubborn as he was, he's been willing to change the formation. So as much as we can say he's stubborn and frustrating, and we're going to talk about some of the ways he's frustrating later on with some of those questions. Quite bluntly, I'll ask you, uh, if you had to give a percentage, uh, I'll put you on the spot here because I didn't do it. So if you had to give a percentage between how much credit is owed Coleman and how much credit are owed the individual players for their recent performances, how would you uh, articulate that? 
Well, that's a really good question. I think it just depends on how much credit you gave Guardiola when the Pep team was winning all of those titles. You know, if, if uh, and uh, you know, you need to sort of put both of them together. If um, in the 2010 Guardiola golden years sort of thing, you gave Guardiola 70% of it or, and then the players 30, then at this time you would probably give Kuman around 50% and the players 50. You know, I think that a manager, as Guardiola has said many times himself, a manager is nothing without his players. I think that if Guardiola is coaching Barca in 2008 without Xavi, Iniesta, Messi, Puyol, Dani Alves, Avidal, etc., etc., John Piquet, Pedro coming through, Busquets, he doesn't win what he does. And, um, you know, you give those players to Kuma now at their peak, he probably will be doing, some, will be doing something very similar. Maybe not in the same way, but that team under any coach, I think, would have been very successful. So you need to put things into perspective. But I think that you cannot take away from the fact that Kuman, as you've said already, has been stubborn and has been sticking to his ideals and things are beginning to flourish. But I don't think we can, you know, get super excited about just three games. We just need to see where it's going. But obviously, good signs are always positive because really we haven't had many this season, have we? And to be honest, not even the end of last season either. So it's a good good time to be a culé and uh, let's just <laughs> I'm just gonna say this uh, now is the time when the bandwagoners that sort of left us halfway through last year keep coming back you know and the people who say that I'm only supporting Barca because of Messi they're gonna let other people back in but you know this is this is what happens we're on the way to becoming a winning club on a weekly basis again and that is great and uh, well done to everyone who's been listening to the podcast throughout the not so great months and years um, and it's, it's con- let's continue to improve, really. Yeah, and one of the ways that Barca can improve is to win a trophy. And Vilmos and Damjan have said, how likely is it that Barca wins the Supercopa? And I, mean, I don't know how, I don't think we need to answer that specific question, but let's change it just a bit in that what would a Supercopa win mean? Now, uh, I will put in the description, I have done my homework in the past uh, on YouTube. There's a history of the Supercopa. Um, it's very exciting, very uh, <laughs> very entertaining, maybe not as much as the Copa. It's good. Country. Well, it's, it's good. But, and I think there's a hierarchy. We know the Champions League is the glitz, and there's actually less history in the Champions League, but the Champions League is obviously where the glitz and the glamour come from and the glory. The Liga, that's a trophy that, as we've said many, many times, is so important. It's the heart of FC Barcelona. It's the heart of Spanish football. The Liga trophy does matter. And then the Copa del Rey, Barcelona, I think as cool as we've started to be to take advantage, I mean, uh, take it for granted, if you will. But the Copa del Rey does matter too. There's great history in, in, in that in that cup it goes back all the way to 1901 and the super copa well it changes recently and i think some of the places that it's been played and the way it's been used as for spanish football to make some money on the side and for some commercial success i think has taken a little bit of the shine of what the spanish super copa was supposed to be it was supposed to be this clash of titans it's supposed to be the clash of the best teams from the previous season in spain and a reward for being some of the top teams there but now because teams like Barcelona and Real Madrid uh, and whoever's in the Champions League with them, Sevilla, usually Atletico Madrid, they play so many matches, right? Some of the, the glory, it just winds up being another match on, the, on, a, on a crowded fixture list. So some of the glory of the what was the Supercopa for a little bit there, I think particularly in the 70s and 80s, uh, is gone a bit. So this Supercopa is just four teams. It used to just be two, but now it's four. We all associate that first for Barca on Wednesday. And if they do win that match, it's Athletic Club again or Real Madrid, whoever wins that one. I, I know kool will be pulling hard for Athletic Club, obviously. Uh, but all that said, uh, all of a sudden, you know, a week from now, usually when there comes out Classico, there's this buildup. There's this buildup. You wait. There's anticipation. But, um, you know, it takes a win first on Wednesday. So you don't want to count your chicken before they hatch. But, hey, on Sunday, before our next podcast, Barcelona could be facing Real Madrid. So it's, it's a weird thing where it's all hypothetical because, again, Real Madrid have to beat Athletic Club. And I think more uh, importantly, Barcelona have to beat Real Sociedad first. I think the importance of La Supercopa um, has always depended on how well you've gone on the other ones. Yeah. So when we were winning, you know, Champions League for fun, uh, not that many years ago, then the Supercopa was pretty much irrelevant. You know, I remember playing against Sevilla, even not even just Madrid all the time, but against Sevilla, Atletico. And um, to be honest, it was for me, it was the summer games in which you sort of began to see it was obviously an official match. 
but you began to see where the team was going that season. Yeah. And for me at the time, I was normally on holidays in the south of Spain. So it would just be, you know, what I would be watching while I get ready to go party until six, seven in the morning after. Yeah, um, so, with, your, uh, with your Ibiza flex there. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Everyone jealous, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's that's what happens when you're <laughs> Catalan, Spanish, etc. You you get you get those things. But um now obviously in the middle of the season, it matters. Um it, we are in a season in which Barça unless things change, and I still believe the same, I don't think we're going to win La Liga, really. I think we may be close in the end, but I don't think we're winning it. Um, Champions League, it's very, very difficult. Um, Copa del Rey, we could win that. Um, and Supercopa, I think, is a, it's a title that we could, you know, it's an official title, so you could just win it and say, right, we didn't go trophyless all season, even though you technically did, because it doesn't matter that much. So I think that, you know, it is, it is good. It is good that we're competing at the highest level. We could not easily, but I think we've got a chance to beat Real Sociedad. And then you said something there earlier that I slightly disagree with. I'm more than happy to face Madrid in the final because I think it gives you more shine if you win. Yeah. You know, if you if you face Real Sociedad and Bilbao, for example, then it's like, yeah, but you didn't beat Madrid because they were sleeping, they didn't take it seriously, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just happy to hopefully Madrid win, we win again, and then we face in the final. And um, if they beat us in the final, say, obviously, I have to say about counting chickens, but if we were if we had a classical in the final and we lost to Madrid, that's what everyone expects us to do. Everyone thinks Madrid are better than us this year. That just adds up to the rhetoric. But with the current run we've got, bring it on and see see where we are. Yeah, agreed. It's it's a good landmark to decide where the team is now in January when the first of Fasigo was played. Real Madrid was the far superior team, but look in the table and Barcelona is only three points behind. Real Madrid. So it could be a reminder that that second El Clasico could change a lot. I mean, that that's what flips it, right? The three points is if Barcelona goes out and beats Real Madrid, now they're even on points. And that's as simple as math goes. So you also mentioned too, the Copa del Rey, which is getting underway. It, it's already been underway with some of the, the mm -hmm. I want to say lower level teams, but Barcelona only playing Cornea, the same team that knocked out Atletico Madrid because they beat a first division team in Atletico Madrid. That was last week. And this is the same Cornea team though. And a reminder that Cornea is 15 meters away from Espanol Stadium. So uh, yeah. I wouldn't say it's a rivalry match, but it certainly is one on the other part of town, if you will, or as oh, well. you like say, in put, Cornea. Put it this way. There are two teams in Cornea. One of them is Cornea, and the other one is Espanol, which is such a great thing to say. And uh, also, <laughs> the listeners probably don't know this, but my brother, obviously, who played for Barca uh, when he was 13, 14 years old, um, he played for Cornea for a year. So I'm actually very happy that they, obviously he's retired now because uh, he's old like me sort of thing. <laughs> but um, I'm just really happy for Cornellà that they made it so far. Um, obviously a working class city, um, a club with very humble beginnings that they have done their work from the youth system really, really, really well for many years now. I think over the last 15 years, you know, Cornellà was nowhere to be seen even at Cadete or Infantil sort of under 13s, under 15s, under 17s even. And uh, they they promoted a lot of players to the first team throughout the years. And uh, you can see the benefits. And, and that's a lesson for all of us to know. I mean, we support Barca, we know this, but it hasn't happened lately. If you do a great job at youth level, you can end up competing um, with, with the best. So Cornellà in throughout the whole of the youth system, they're competing with Espanol, Barca, Valencia, Mallorca, who are the teams sort of in that sort of Spain, and even, I don't know, uh, Dam, San Gabriel, and loads of teams at Barcelona level and Catalonia level, and uh, that's credit to them. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. If you do look up, as, as I do, if you look at where some of the U-17s come from, some of the U-18s who've showed up for the first time in, uh, in the academy, they are coming from Dom and from, as they have for, for a long time. And they obviously, uh, some of the best talents, whether it's Alejandro Balde or Shus Alba, they've been plucked from Espanol, but Cornea mm -hmm. as well. They'll spend a, a season at Cornea and get their feet at that level when they're 15, 16. Again, so much changes for teenagers. So Barcelona are, uh, they are looking, the academy looks for uh, Cornea players as well. And for me, it's going to be as weirdly as we're trying to break down Cornea here. Uh, it's what Cornea that, again, that you will see. Because right before Christmas, Barca B beat this very same Cornea side, the one that beat Atletico Madrid. So things happen, things can change as well. And I, I think this is a Cornea team that will be playing with confidence at this point in their season, uh, just because of what they've done against Atletico Madrid in this competition. But I really hope to see a team, and I think we will. It's with the spine of Umtiti, Junior Firpo, 
Ricky Pouge, and I expect Pianic to play as well because he with Busquets now starting every match in and out. Uh, Pianic will probably start this one as well. Then I want the rest to be Barca B. Conrad De La Fuente, Ies Moriba, Arnau Comas, Hunter Oriana playing in Bus- the Busquets role because uh, I, people have argued, should he be promoted to the first team? And the answer is no, not at the moment, Andre uh, Oriana. He needs to have a full good season and get a preseason with the first team before he does that. But he should be starting the Copa del Rey. He's uh, Pjanic and De Jong. If they're going to be the interiors, then there really is no other defensive midfielder. Oh, Mateus Fernandez, but okay. But anyway, so I think that Hunter Oriana deserves, oh, that's right. Mateus Fernandez might start. I, I, I forget, I forget he's on the team, Frances. But anyway, he is on the team, so he might start, but I would actually expect Hoder, uh, I would I would hope to say Andre Oriana would get that start. And then Brothwaite up top, I guess, because there is no other center forward in the academy to even be promoted. But that said, mm-hmm. I would actually put Trincao in the middle and Callado, Alice Callado on the right, on the right wing. Because this does bring us to our next topic. Uh, it's a quick topic from Douglas. Would you send out Trincao on loan and promote Callado? I know. No. no. Why so? No, I wouldn't think so. I think that Trincao, if he was to go, he would have gone already. You know, I would have sort of sent it out for the season. Um, I think, and you know, you're the expert because you watched him for many, many times in, when he was playing in Portugal. But um, I think that if he's endured what he's endured over the last four months in terms of adapting, I don't think going somewhere else now to start adapting again is, is beneficial for him. I think that the best solution for him is to make the best out of those 20, 25 minutes that he, he was getting last month. Um, I think his time has been reduced a little bit um, simply because he's not producing enough when he comes on. Uh, but um, I think that sending him on to adapt somewhere else now is not beneficial given the fact that he just swapped in the summer. Um, so, and then obviously for Alex Callado, as you just mentioned um, for another player, I think that he needs to complete a year at Barca B. Um, he's the captain, obviously. He scored a cracker this weekend uh, from the corner. And um, I think that he's just coming back from injury as well. So I think that he needs to put a consistent season and then in the summer see where he is. I think he could do one like Monchu, for example, who obviously was loaned up to Girona and he's doing really well in there. I think that that could be a path that Collado could follow. I'm not saying he won't make it at the first team, but I, what I am saying is that there are a lot of players around his age or younger, like Ansu Fati, for example, that are already part of the first team, that hopefully they will be um, a little bit older, obviously, naturally, they're going to be older, but a little bit better than they are this season, more confident, more established. And I don't know if there's room for Collado just yet. Um, I think that at this moment in time, Trincao's ceiling is higher. Trincao's level of experience is also higher right now. And I think Collado needs a good season of us, and probably alone somewhere else next year, if he's to have any chance of breaking the first team in two seasons time. Yeah, I, I was back and forth on this and I, I definitely understand the argument about Trincao having to adapt to another team, but in the same way that we expect that now Alenia, who's gone out on his second loan in just two seasons, last year he adapted quite well to Real Betis and this year we expect and hope that he adapts well to Hadafe back with his good friend, Mark Kukurea. So for me though, Trincao, it does come down to, I think the player. If, uh, if the player is comfortable with leaving, and I know the agent may not like it, but if you can get a team to pay one or two million euros or something like that for a six month loan, you take it because he's not playing, as you mentioned, from what I saw at Braga, he's just not comfortable yet at Barcelona still. And yet many of his issues, like a ton of young players that are thrown into the fire are not physical, but they're, it's something happening between the ears. So if he does need confidence and I, my, my fear is that if you keep him on the Barca bench and play him for an average of what he's playing now, 11 minutes per match, and you do that for six more months, then you're going to lose the player that you brought and you bought for more than 30 million euros from the beginning. So if you can get him, send him to another Spanish team, it could even be someplace, I mean, maybe not Girona, but it could be a team that is, uh, is, is, is similar to Barcelona or at least has a system that is going to need a winger, if you will. Uh, maybe an, an A-bar is one that I think of because of the importance they do put on their wingers uh, and they're a smaller squad as well. So you let him get his legs back for six months with another Spanish team, keep him in the Liga, and then try again in the summer. Let him get another run out. I mean, Barca might have, whether Coleman does well or not, you know, we keep saying it, they might have a new manager at the end of the season, regardless of, of Coleman's success. So in the meantime, though, the argument about Kayata was right. He is returning from injury, but he does, not only does he have three goals in, in six games, but 
This is also his third season with Barca B, though. He is going to be 22 soon. He's 21. So it's not like he's a young player. It's not like he's a new player to being a professional. Um, and yes, that injury over the summer is why we didn't see him around the first team. And honestly, though, watching him against uh, um, over, over the weekend for Barca B again, when you said he had, he, he had the brace, one was the Olympico from the corner. He's just too good for the third division. He's not only the best player with Barca B, but I, I've been watching almost every Barca B match. I missed one or two, but he's the best player in the third division by a good distance. It's not close. I, so I think that brings up another question. That if you're not going to loan Trincao, and I know that uh, you kind of have to make the decision. Do you want to prioritize trying to be promoted if you're Barca B? And Callado is going to be the most important player to help you do that, even more important than Mariba and, uh, and Conrad. It's going to be Callado. He is their best. He is their influential. He is their their talisman. So you, the question is going to be, do you keep him there and try to get promoted? Or do you do what's best for Callado's career? And if you want to give him a shot in the first team, eventually, maybe he's the player that you loan out. And I just, I just don't see that happening because as you said, he's so important to Barcelona B. But my argument for him and how well he's playing in form right now, if you did choose to loan Trincao to help him get his confidence back, you could do much, much worse than giving Collado 20 minutes per game, using him to rotate, et cetera, et cetera. He's not taking Dembele or Fati's spots, and he's not starting over Fessy or Griezmann, but he is certainly good enough to play for the first team. Uh, and I would argue, too, that Collado playing in the third division this season, even coming back from injury, has been much more beneficial to his development than having Pooh sit on the bench and not get any minutes for first team. Yep, which is precisely why he should go out on loan if he's not going to play. Um, I think that I was listening to the press conference after the game and, um, you know, Barca have won three consecutive, consecutive games. is the best streak, winning streak that Kuman has led since he joined Barca. And, and you know, he, looked, he felt like a century since the last one. And uh, the third question is about Ricky Puig. You know, it, it's not... <laughs> to me, it, it doesn't make sense. You know, it, I think but selling papers. That's that's the only re- we know. That's the only reason. And they call me exactly by it. But it's the same thing with us. We get questions all the time. But yeah, he was fun when he came on against Granada. But I don't know. It is what it is. It's just it's just the media. That's what it is. It's just you can exactly you roll your eyes and let it roll off. Exactly. But it is a distraction that I don't think is needed. Uh, and I think Kuman is getting quite tired of it. Um, he, in the last one, last press conference, he even said. I would just talk about a young player. It could be Conrad, it could be Mateus, it could be Junior Firpo, even he mentioned. Uh, it doesn't have to be Ricky all the time, but you guys just keep asking me about Ricky all the time, so I'll tell you about Ricky sort of thing. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I think that a, a player like that should play. Um, is Ricky Puig good enough to play for Barca? I'd say so, coming off the bench, yes. But if the manager doesn't want to give him the minutes that he needs, and the thing is, he's not 17, He's not 18, he's 21 years old, you know? So he's getting into an age that he needs to be playing yep. all the time. And uh, his, his, his situation in my eyes is different from Trincao because he wasn't signed for a lot of money. He just, you know, got promoted from La Masia. And I think that he needs to see something else outside unless he's going to be playing regular minutes, which he really isn't, um, and then come back stronger, uh, maybe under a new manager next year, who knows? Uh, we'll see everything depending on the election. Which we haven't mentioned yet today, but uh, things things will change. And but I don't think it's the best situation for Ricky right now. So I think that as much as he loves Barca, if I was him, I would I would be going on loan. Yeah, it's it's the same thing we've been talking about with Pooj. We keep repeating it every week that he needs to get playing time. And the one thing that's changed over the course of the season is now he is the backup to Pedri with Coutinho injured for this season. Uh, Pedri, who is younger than Pooj deserves to play. So it's not like Pooj is the young whippersnapper that needs to be playing in that spot and not getting any minutes. Because again, yeah. it, 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 we're talking now about a Pedri being the player that is deserving and earned his minutes. Now, you mentioned the presidential election. As we know, it is at this point, as they've collected signatures, yes, we've, we, unfortunately, we, we bid adieu. Thank you for starting the motion of, uh, the motion of um, no confidence against uh, Bartomeu, but Jordi Ferrer, uh, that was your claim to fame. And, and now he's out, uh, as many of the other candidates will be out. It, it, as we expected with these signatures, it's going to come down basically to Laporta against Font. Yes, there might be some other signatures that are, uh, some other candidates might get over the threshold and they pick off a few votes here or there, but it is Laporta versus Font. And Laporta has now, just based on the signatures that were collected, now we're going to take from heavy favorite, we're going to add a heavy in there and call him the heavy, heavy favorite at this point. But we'll, we'll see in 13 days now, unless uh, because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, 
that election could be pushed back, but it seems like they're going to try to get it through. That's what all the candidates say they'd like to do. That's seemingly what most of the socios are willing to do. And, and it seems like the Barcelona, this is again, the city government, even more so than uh, the Spanish government or the Catalan government. There's so many different mm -hmm. layers of this and uh, regulations on the pandemic and how they're gonna navigate this. But it seems like the city ordinances at this moment, because again, Barcelona being a city, they're going to have tighter restrictions, lockdowns and all that stuff more so than you're going to have in the region of Girona or Sabadell or wherever it may be. That said, we're not talking about the presidential election, more so what the president is going to have to deal with when he gets into office. Because Frederick and Dinesh, this is our final topic here. They ask what should be done about the debts? What will Barcelona or what should be Barcelona looking at as far as the outside investors go. And that's based on a story that came out this week that Barca are looking to outside investors potentially to come into the club and financially help. I mean, let's, let's be frank, save the club at this point. Yes. Um, I think the first thing that whoever comes in needs to do is to know exactly how deep the hole is. Um, I think that the numbers that Bartomeu would like to pass on or has already reportedly passed on via two skets they may not be the numbers. You know, I think that an institution that, that has traditionally had so much money and has been able to reach so far in terms of financial power um, could, could, could also go the other way. Um, and I think that when there's the Goldman Sachs being mentioned, when you've got different unexpected pots coming here, there and everywhere, um, you need to really, really look. You need to get an auditor who is external um, I would say so, an, an auditor that's not Catalan even, so that there's no connection or dark sort of favors or, or, or knowledge of whoever runs it. So someone who is totally impartial needs to go in and see, see what's there and then decide. You know, I think that one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing about Barca, is that it's, it's one of the three clubs in Spain that is not owned by anyone but the supporters. So obviously the other two being Real Madrid and Athletic Club de Bilbao. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing that Barca have. It's, it's a democracy. Obviously, being a democracy a lot of the time slows things down, uh, you could argue. You could say that it is much easier when there's, um, I don't know, the Sheikh at Manchester City or, or Roman Abramovich at Chelsea. You know, I think this, these models, obviously, all the power falls into one person and then things can actually happen quicker. And also those guys, they've got money out of their own pockets, really, uh, that they're bringing in. And so... You know, if they lose a bit of money, that that's on them. Barca doesn't work like that, and I don't want him. I don't want Barca to ever brand it that way. Uh, it is run by the sources, and as a Catalan, it is one of the proudest things that I can be part of, and I don't want that to change. So, obviously, bringing any foreign investors is never going to be something that um, I personally, I know that the vast majority of Catalans like me would would agree with this. Is not something that we want to see. Um, we would, I, I would personally, I can't really speak on behalf of anyone else, but I would rather Barca be a lesser club for some years, three, four, five years even, and not being able to buy your Rivaldo, Romario, Ronaldinho's of the world, but actually remain true to the club that we are, remain true to the club that obviously has been going for 128, 29 or 30 years now, and uh, the club that we love and the club that we're proud of. Um, I wouldn't want an investor from... I'm just saying one, an Emirati investor to come and buy the club. And then just Barca becoming like any other club. Um, you've got it behind your ears. I can see it now. Uh, Mexican club, you know, we're not a club like any other club. And, and we are, yep, you feel like that? <laughs> Moving around. Um, we are a club that is different. Um, we are a club that represents more than just football. It's not just a ball running around. It is a feeling. It is, it is the heart of, of Catalonia. It is the motor of, of who we are as a, arguably a nation, and a lot of people would disagree with that, but you know, I, need to, I need to say how I feel it. And as a, as a very important region, and Barca is out of everything that we have, you know, the Gaudi architecture, uh, you know, the beaches, as we mentioned already before, the nightlife, et cetera. The biggest thing we've got in Catalonia that, that everyone around the world knows about every week, week in, week out is FC Barcelona. And for that club to be owned by some Russian millionaire, Sorry, that's not something we want. If there was no alternative, I think that whoever is the president needs to look deeper to find an alternative. But I would rather not win a Champions League for five years, even 10 years, even 20 years, 
um, that having the club being owned by someone that basically has got no relationship to the club or could sell the club in five years' time. I mean, the, the, the sources are never going to sell the club. Yeah. You know, there is a waiting list of three, four, five, seven years to become a saucy. And this, this, is, this is money coming in from the most faithful fans, owners you'll ever have. And it, it must continue. The president must find a solution for it and has to stay. Yeah, I mean, the good news was even with some kind of outside investor groups coming in, Barca wouldn't sell off more than 49% of the club. So there would never be a, a another majority, uh, majority rather. Um, basically, Barca, as it says in the statutes, would always impose its own version of the Bundesliga's 50 plus one rule, which means that a club must hold the majority of its own rights. So uh, the socios will always run Barcelona. As long as it's a club, FC Barcelona will always be run by the socios uh, because they themselves would never vote to give up um, more than 49% of ownership of the club. Uh, this means that there would be, there never will be a takeover by some mega company with other motives. And as you mentioned, Barca might, it, it might hurt Barcelona in the long run as a club, because uh, as we know, it is worrisome to me to owe so much to Goldman Sachs, as you mentioned, but that is just a loan. That is not an investment. Goldman Sachs does not have now a share uh, or they do not have rights in the club. It is merely a loan that Barca uh, must pay off or they are looking at some financial um, difficulties, many financial difficulties if, as if they aren't already enough. But investing in the club, uh, honestly, in the world of Man City and PSG, as we spoke about, uh, Barca may not need to sell its whole soul, but they, they might need to sell part of it to still compete at the top level. And as you said, you know, the opinion you have of whether they should sell their soul or not is no and deal with the consequences of, of keeping who you are and not selling your soul in that way. Um, my thought from that is that when we look at the commercial and global success, and especially even the president, the money that's being made because Barcelona is such a major mega club uh, is something that I think even businessmen surrounding the club just can't pass up. Uh, and you just have to basically balance that line of not being corrupt and not uh, selling off, as I said, the full soul of the club. Um, because Spanish clubs are in debt. They're in dangerous debt in ways that, and we've seen with League 1, and this is only going to get worse. League 1 is in major trouble uh, as far as the financial success of some of those clubs. Uh, everyone but PSG are in trouble. And we're going to see how French football, how that continues to work out, I think, in the next coming months and maybe years. But Spanish clubs all over. Uh, and even it's not necessarily a, a knock on Laporta, but the way that uh, the Catalan club Rus that he was uh, involved in, they went, they were liquefied. They were a second to third table or uh, second to third division team. And uh, mm -hmm. things got ugly. We look at the financial straits that Valencia are in at the moment, and they're one point away from the relegation zone because of it. Uh, so we are seeing even Deportivo La Coruña. They're in the third division because they couldn't handle it. And uh, the story of Spanish football is one that uh, because of the makeup of Spanish football clubs and the finances of those clubs that they play so close to the, uh, they say they play so close to the tipping line that you worry about it. And having even, even Real Madrid with Florentino Perez, uh, you can have a rich president, but that may not just be enough for Real Madrid and Barca anymore. Because Real Madrid are in, they're not in the financial straits that Barca are in, but it's not like they're in a good situation. How much money did they spend in the transfer window this summer? Zero, zero not only because of COVID, but Florentino Perez, he has that Spanish construction and real estate money. But if he's not an actual financial group with huge investments coming in from all these different revenue sources, it's difficult to have enough money to run a global cl club just from one's business acumen in one industry. The other thing I'll say is there are other possibilities here. We're talking about selling the stadium rights. We're talking about um, the real estate that is involved in the jerseys that Barcelona are wearing. Uh, and we've, we've talked about whether it's like the Tar Foundations or uh, they want to put UNICEF back on the front, but we do talk about how that might not physically be possible. Uh, you're going to have to make a concession there as long as you have UNICEF on the jersey. The big one, though, here for me, and this is the whole thing about Spanish football, the broadcasting rights are where Barcelona and Spanish football clubs in general can save themselves. It's different in different locations, so all I can do is speak to the U.S. deal here, but that's with BN Sports until May of 2024. In that time, with Ronaldo and Messi out of the picture for either renewal of that deal or a new contract, Ligo needs to, in the next three years, they have got to have proper strategies in the US, in China, in the UK to prove to a substantial audience that they merit a bigger broadcasting deal. Uh, broadcasting revenue and British football and the snobbery, uh, rather, broadcasting revenue and British football 
that you know football is ours that whole thing about the the british the british mantra that football is belongs to the british and they're the original whatever that's snobbery those are the only two reasons that people can argue it's the best league in the world because when you actually watch the football the argument is not of whether the premier league is beyond everybody else because they're spending the most money so they should have the most player uh, the best players if you will but no they have the best players who are most readily available to the most eyes around the world that's actually what why it's the league that it is being the premier league so that's going to be the i think it's going to be huge to the future of both barca and real madrid those contracts in china in the uk in the us and how the league is being broadcast because when you look at uh these are again single single entity in the us so it's a little different but when you look at the nba their shares it's 65 percent of their their collective bargaining agreement 65 percent is a broadcast revenue so if even with not without having fans in the stands, that's why these major U.S. based, even though the U.S. you know being here has not dealt with COVID well, an understatement of the century there. Um, we've not dealt with that well. And you said the word democracy, and I winced a little bit because of <laughs> the U.S. But that's a different story for another time. Uh, maybe a whole different podcast, um, not on the Barcelona podcast. But anyway, so with what's happening with the broadcast revenue in leagues around the U.S. That's the reason why, even though the U.S. wasn't dealing with COVID well, they pushed forward and had these, these games and these matches, even when they might not have been safe, because broadcast revenue is such a huge part of the U.S. Um, collective bargaining agreement. So I think Spanish football is going to change a bit. And we've even seen in the last 10 to 15 years, as Barca and Real Madrid, uh, as Barcelona were getting good, you know, even 10 years ago, I look at it and I had to watch them on the tiniest screen. Uh, I, was it legal? I'm not sure. I was a teenager, so I, I can't be tried. So anyway, the point is, um, I, for me to even to watch the greatness of Messi and Xavi and Iniesta, it wasn't readily available unless they were in the Champions League. But that has all changed in 10 years. Now I can have them on my phone, on my iPad, on the TV, on I could simulcast, whatever it may be. And now there are all these different ways to watch. And so coming up in, uh, in these different years as broadcasting deals are available in all these different markets, Spanish football, led by FC Barcelona and Real Madrid at the negotiating table, have to lead the way and they have to make sure that they can promise viewers we are going to be La Liga before Ronaldo and Messi we are going to be La Liga after Ronaldo and Messi and it is a league that you want to watch and I think that is what's going to save Spanish football yes for sure I've got very little to add just to say that um there are two teams in Spain Barca and Madrid who are the icing of the cake but there are another 20 and arguably another 40 because you count Segunda División A as well that need to survive for the whole product to to continue so as um obviously we want barca to get all the money themselves but ultimately it needs to be shared equally and you know it is better now than it was five years ago to be fair but i think it needs to be shared equally so that everyone survives and we can continue to have a, a great league that you know particularly this year is not a two horse race so that people can tune in to watch it yep i agree i think it's a good place to stop it's a good place to leave it we will be back next week we don't know if barca have one match until our next podcast they might have two and one of them might be an all class to go so certainly there'll be a lot of exciting things happening this week potentially and if not we will be back to i guess break down the cornea preview a little bit more but it'll be back to the liga and hopefully the next time we talk barcelona how will have continued to win some matches so francis thanks again for joining me and thank to you the listeners for joining in again you can tap in the app check out your show notes to subscribe find us on social media you know where we're at Twitter at the Barcelona Pod or Helton D13 for me on Twitter at the Barcelona Pod, our closed Facebook group where we got these listener questions for LaRonda is tvpod.link backslash group. Deeper dive discussions, all that. Patreon, that's why these shows are made on with the help from our Patreons, tvpod.link backslash Patreon. We're also on YouTube, as you know, the Barcelona Podcast. I have, again, a link in the description for the history of the Supercopa. So if you need help getting to sleep tonight, maybe pop that in and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll take it's, it's send you news town. So check us out there, though, at least, and hit that subscription button so you can see all the exciting content there including the match review so thanks so much for listening to the barcelona podcast until next time we'll talk to you soon and forza barca, barca.